Thank you for being here to worship God. Thank you for all participating in the singing, building each other up, teaching and admonishing each other through song. Thank you for those who have led us in prayer and for those who served us in the Lord's table. Thank you for serving us. As we come to our lesson this morning, I hope that we will be encouraged and uplifted. And you will also be encouraged at, at the, the coming uh, new theme for 2024. If you remember last week, we gave a lesson about wrestling with God. And I mentioned how that lesson and this morning's lesson were both two lessons that were met or meant to kind of set up and prepare us for our coming theme for the year. And this, for 2024, we are intending to spend about a fourth of our lessons, it's about 13 sermons next year, as looking at subjects related with apologetics and evidences-based type things. And these are all different subjects that, uh, different, or a type of subject that help us build up our faith, but also help us answer questions that people of the world would give as objections to Christianity, as objections to believing in Jesus or, or why they should become a Christian. And so this morning lesson is another one of those lessons to help, us set, help set us up for that theme for 2024. And this morning, I'd like to talk to you about the concept of worldview, and we're going to be spending a majority of our time in Acts chapter 17, if you want to turn there with me this morning. Acts chapter 17 is where we'll be spending a majority of our time. <coughs> But in Acts chapter 17, we can read about Paul and, and his travels, and specifically we're going to look at his, in, his interactions with uh, in the city of Athens. And in, in, his, in this interaction, we can see the concept of worldview emerge, and we'll talk about how that can help us uh, and set us up for our theme for 2024 this year. Acts chapter 17 is where we're going to be, and I'd like to begin by reading Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 21, if you would follow along and read with me. Acts 17, starting in verse 16. Now, while Paul was at Athen, waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was, was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was t preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Here in Acts chapter 17, we, we see Paul in Athens I think it's an accurate description to, to say that Paul in Athens was in a place where there was a world full of ideas. And as we consider our modern world today, that is certainly true today. We live in a world full of ideas. Everybody has some sort of idea about what is the best way to live life. What is right and what is wrong? Is there anything right and what's wrong? What is the truth? We certainly do live in a world full of ideas. And if you've, you've been a Christian for, for any length of time or, or you've been an adult for any length of time, certainly when these kind of questions are brought up, certainly you know that there are many differing opinions and views to these, to these different kinds of questions. And when we see those and we ask those kind of questions, we are approaching the subject of worldview. And so we can see that Paul here is interacting with this very same world of ideas. And as he goes and addresses the, these people here in Athens, essentially he is speaking to them about God, but everything he says about God speaks and points us to the concept of worldview. And so I'd like for us to take some time looking at what that is and for us to look and see that here in the scriptures. So you might ask, well, what is a worldview? What do you mean by that, Brother Beckley, when you say a worldview? What is this concept that you are bringing to our ears? In short, a worldview is a framework through which we see and live as we interact with the world. In other words, if you see the world is made by God and you believe that there is a God, then you're going to certainly live your life as though there is a God who created the world. But if you don't believe, for example, that a God exists, well, then that certainly also is going to affect the way that you see the world and how you live and interact with it. And so when we ask questions that point us to these kinds of things, that point us to how we see, how we live, and how we interact with the world, this is the big subject of worldview. And also when we talk about the subject of worldview, there's some other acknowledgments that we need to make as we look and approach this subject. This framework through which we live and see the world and as we interact with the world 
it is made up of presuppositions to at least five basic questions. There are at least five basic questions to any worldview. And let's go over those now. You might ask, when looking at these five basic questions, what does your worldview say about God? As we get, stated earlier in example, is there a God? Is there no God? Are there multiple gods? All of these things are questions that whatever your answer is to them, they affect the way that you see and interact with the world. Another basic question about worldview is what does your worldview say about mankind? Does mankind have a purpose? Does mankind have a purpose in relation to God if there is a God? Uh, is, is mankind's purpose simply to do good or is mankind's purpose to be autonomous robots that just live? What your worldview says about mankind also affects the way that you see, view, and interact with the world. What about knowledge? Are humans capable of knowledge? Are we able to understand and to know things, or are we simply having to embrace the fact that we just simply can't know everything? What does your worldview say about knowledge? Because again, that affects the way that you see and live and interact with the world. What does your worldview say about morality? Is there a right and wrong, or is there no right and wrong? Again, what your worldview says about morality affects how you live your life and how, what you teach others about what is the meaning and the purpose of life. And then, of course, it also talks about reality. Have you ever thought about what happens after death? Is there something that happens after death? What your worldview says about that, again, will dictate and impact the way you live your life. If you can live your life with a hope that there's something after death, that can grant you a lot of peace of mind. But if death is the end, you better live life now to the fullest. Again, all of these things are things that affect the way that we see and view and, and interact with the world. And that's what I mean by presuppositions. We all assume answers to these questions. Again, all of us here, we are Christians. So we live our lives with the assumption that God does exist, that mankind does have a purpose, that we are able to know God, that God tells us what is right and wrong, and that there is a hope after death but there's also a fear of what comes after death if we do not remain faithful. But what I mean by, by presuppositions is that what you think about these qualities, it affects what makes sense to you. Someone who doesn't believe that there is a God and that he created the world, concepts that teach that God created the world don't make sense to these people. In fact, they reject these ideas, not because they have necessarily a problem with a certain aspect of God, but they just don't believe that God exists. And so you understand, when we understand this concept of worldview, this immediately opens our eyes to what we are dealing with when we are interacting with other people. And that's certainly what Paul is doing here in Acts 17. And we're going to read about that in just a second. Look back in Acts 17 here. Notice the kind of people that Paul is talking to here. Verse 16, he's waiting around in Athens. He's waiting for Silas and Timothy to come back to him. And while he's waiting around Athens, he sees a bunch of idols, and he feels provoked in the spirit to go speak to them. And what does he speak to them about? It says that he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection to them. But he's speaking to Jews. He's speaking to devout people. And he's speaking to just anybody that's there in the marketplace each and every day. Paul is speaking to everybody, not just Jews, not just people who consider themselves religious. He's speaking to everybody. In verse 18, what is mentioned for us are the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers. These are Greek people who are the thinkers of the, of the, of the ancient world at that time. People, you imagine people some, like Plato and Aristotle, those kind of people, the great thinkers of our human history. These Epicureans and Stoic philosophers would be people just like them, but they would have been the people who were the thinkers of Paul's day. These people are also interested in what Paul has to say about who God is and what he says about the world and what he has to say about mankind. Paul is speaking to these people, and he's speaking to them about worldview concepts. And again, what you think about these, about these items up here on the screen, they affect the way that you, affect the world, that you see the world. It affects what makes sense to you and what you believe to be true and to be right. And it is on this level of which we see Paul interacting with these people and reasoning with them from the Scriptures. So now we go and we read following verses 22 through 21. And I want you to consider those items we talked about as, as the five basic questions of worldview. See if you can point this out in the text as we read just now. Acts chapter 17, reading in verse 22 through 31. So they've taken Paul and they put him up on this big stage to speak to all these different kinds of people. And here's what Paul says. Verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, 
Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What you therefore worship as unknown, this is what I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our inner being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art or imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to us all by raising him from the dead now, that's a bit of a lengthier reading but as you hear what Paul is saying imagine someone standing up on a big stage in front of thousands and thousands of people and he says all of this about God and what God says is good, right, and true, and about what God says the way things are. Paul certainly said a whole lot of things about God here to these people, to these people who have their own ideas of what is true. If there is a God, if there is multiple gods, he's speaking this on their level to them about the one true God. Let's see if we can point out some of the things Paul said about God that point us to our five basic worldview questions. What does Paul say about God? Well, for that, you look at verse 24 and verse 29. In verse 24, Paul said about God that God, is, God made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives life to all mankind and breath and everything. Jump down to verse 29. We ought not to think that this divine being is like gold or silver or stone or that he is an image formed by the art or the imagination of man. Paul makes some pretty significant claims about who God is to, again, all these different types of people who have different opinions about what God or gods are and which ones are true and which ones are false. Paul is giving them a framework for them to see who is the true God. He's building a worldview to them and how he describes God to them. Well, what does Paul say about man here? We see that in verse 25 and 26. Again, he points out that God created mankind. He gives life to all mankind and breath and everything. And he made one man from every nation of mankind to live on the face of all the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. He says a lot of things about man here, that man came from God, that God created man, and that God has created and set us and appointed places that they should go and dwell. Paul says a lot about man, about what God, about, about what God has done for man, about how man has come, has come from the creation of God. He also talks and speaks about man's purpose here, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Paul says that mankind has been given an, an, an internal desire to want to know God, to seek Him, and to reach toward Him. Now, some certainly in the world repress that desire, but inwardly, God has given us all a desire to know who He is and to believe that there is some sort of higher power out there and that we should seek Him and feel our way towards Him and even find Him. Which also seems to imply that if, if mankind is going to seek God and feel their way toward Him and find Him, that mankind can know who God is. Some of the world today would suggest we just can't know. We can't know if there's a God. And even if, and even if there is a God, he hasn't revealed himself to us, so we, can, we just can't really know if he exists or not. Except that's not what the Bible says about God. And it's not what the Bible says about mankind being able to know God as well. Certainly Paul is again speaking 
to worldview, to the, the concept of worldview here, and how he describes God and man and man's purpose. He also briefly touches on morality. Notice verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. The word repentance, it means to turn around. It means that you're going this way, and I'm going to turn around and go this way for the rest of my life. I'm not going this way anymore. I'm changing the path. I'm going the opposite direction. Repentance is a word that speaks to right and wrong. Why would I turn around? Because now I believe this is wrong, and I don't want to do what is wrong. In fact, I want to do what is right. Repentance is a word that does call our minds to morality. I should not do this because this is wrong. God said so. But again, imagine for a second, the world says there is no God who determines right and wrong. If there is no right and wrong, you say that there is no morality. Or if you do say there is a morality, where does that morality come from? Again, Paul is speaking to them about morality as well. He's speaking to the concept of worldview and what he says to them. But he also talks about man's eternal state in verse 31. God commands everyone, everywhere to repent. Why? Verse 31, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. He's referring to Jesus there. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising this person, Jesus, from the dead. Paul was giving these people a worldview when he was speaking to them. When he says all these things about God and about man and man's purpose and morality and man's eternal state, Paul is essentially speaking to what we understand today as the concept of worldview. And that's important for us to recognize that that's what he spoke to them about. Paul is speaking to these people about the Christian worldview. What the Bible says, what Christ says, is the proper worldview of the world. And you notice here, I have up here that Christianity is a worldview, because Christianity is a worldview. Well, what do you mean by that? Are you, are you trying to say that Christianity is just like everything else that people say is the way to live? Well, it is to a point. Because Christianity, the Bible tells us how we ought to see the world, and it tells us how we ought to live in it, and how to interact with the world. The Bible does tell us what to do along these lines, along these basic five worldview questions. Certainly, Christianity is also a worldview. And notice not only is, is Christianity depicted here as a worldview, as a way of looking at the world and living, but notice not only what, is this something Paul is teaching, but this was his approach to evangelism. This was Paul's approach to evangelism here in the city of Athens. In a place where it's a world of ideas, that is how he approached people and spoke to them about Jesus and the resurrection. He spoke to these concepts about worldview to evangelize to them, to tell them about Jesus, and to tell, tell them about the resurrection. Now you may ask, okay, Brother Beck, I, I, I kind of see where you're going. I see that, you know, yes, these kind of do relate to the concept of worldview, and, and yes, I see what Paul said to these people and how he evangelized to them, but what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with you today? I'll tell you what. We too have been called for evangelism. Jesus said back in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, Go out into all the world and preach to every creature in every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. The Great Commission as we know it in Matthew chapter 28. We too were told to go out and preach the gospel, to preach the good news to all people. And if Paul used this strategy, used this tactic to preach to people, certainly there's something we can learn from that about how to approach people. And what do we teach them about? What do we talk to people about that hopefully they might obey the gospel? We are going to learn from Paul's example. He spoke to them about the concept of worldview. And we too need to recognize that we too, just as Paul did in Athens, live in a world full of ideas. A world full of ideas of how we ought to live our lives and what is the true meaning of life. Is there a God? Is there anything after death? Why don't we speak to people about what the Bible says about these things? Because people are already thinking about these things. They're already looking and seeking knowledge. Why don't we give them the Bible answer to these things? That's why this applies to you and why it applies to me. We, too, have been called for evangelism. Why don't we learn from Paul's example and how he evangelized to the people in Athens? I have up here, I have um, 
a book up here written by Ronald Nash. And the book is titled Worldviews in Conflict, Choosing Christianity in a World of Ideas. If you like to read, I should have put the quotation mark on the end. But if you like to read books, this is a fantastic book. This was a book that was recommended to me uh, from my time at FC and studies uh, when I took the class Philosophy of Religion. And I've read through this book, and this book really talks about and emphasizes, you know, worldview. And it takes the time to look at what are the various worldviews of the world and how do they compare against Christianity. Because, again, what did Paul do? He's giving them a worldview about who God is, what he says about mankind. Is there, what, what can we know about knowledge, morality, and the eternal state? And in this book uh, up here, he's comparing Christianity to the worldviews of the various world, and you can see how they differ. And so if, if you're looking for a book recommendation, I, I highly recommend this book. It's a very good book, very easy to understand. But I want to share with you a quote that Ronald Nash gives to us in this book. He says, it seems sometimes that few people have any idea what that worldview is or even that they have one. Because everyone has a worldview. Everybody believes something about God. Everybody believes that there's a line that should not be crossed. Everybody believes that there's something about right or wrong, even if you believe that there is no right or wrong. That's still a belief about right or wrong. And few people have any idea what that worldview is or even that they have one. Yet achieving awareness of our worldview is one of the most important things we can do to enhance self-understanding and insight into the worldviews of others Oh, and insight into the worldviews of others is essential to understanding what makes them tick. In other words, Nash is telling us, if we can understand what people think about these things concerning worldview, we can have a starting place of where to talk to them. Something as simple as finding someone that you know and, hey, what, what do you think about God? Do you believe there is a God? If they don't believe a God, then you start there. Hey, do you, do you believe there's a right and a wrong? Do, do you believe in God? Well, you know, I believe in God, and God says there is a right and wrong. Can you speak to them about those things? And when you phrase it this way, again, we see worldview is an help, helps us both understand ourselves better and what we believe and how we understand the, script, the scriptures and are we consistent with what the scriptures teach. But also it gives us a starting place for how we might consider, how do I, how do I talk to that person over there, that person that I know? What, what should I talk to them about? And Paul spoke to them about Jesus and the resurrection. But in doing so, he said all these things about God and about mankind and about what is right and wrong and about knowledge and about the eternal state. This concept of a worldview is a key that we can use to figure out where do I start when it comes to talking to someone that I care about and I hope that they'll obey the gospel. It can help us get, give us a starting place to start when we understand worldview. Something else Nash says is that one of the more important things we can do for others is to help them achieve a better understanding of their own worldview. We can also assist them to improve it, which means eliminating inconsistencies and providing new information that will help fill gaps in their conceptual system. In other words, he's saying, you know, if someone says they have a worldview and they believe that there is a standard, they believe that there is a right or wrong, do they live to that right or wrong? Because again, what is a worldview? It is a framework through which we see and live and interact world. If I believe that murdering someone is wrong, and yet I'm murdering someone every day, I'm living inconsistent with my worldview. We as people naturally understand the concept that we need to be consistent, that if I say I'm going to do this, I really need to do that. And if I don't, I'm not only being inconsistent, but I'm not being a good person by being consistent. I'm not, mat I'm not doing what I say. I'm not doing what I preach, if you will, as the world might say. And yet, we all do this. We all need help with this. We all need help understanding and clarifying what is our worldview, and am I really living consistent to that? It's the same thing as when we look at the scriptures and say, you know what, I do believe the Bible is true, and yet when the Bible tells me that I'm to love everyone and I'm to be patient with them, that I'm to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind, do I actually do that? You know, I need that. And if I need that, certainly others need that as well. And we can help them understand their world would be better and be consistent with it. But ultimately, if I might suggest to you, aside from what Nash says here, it also is an opportunity for us to point them to the Christian worldview. As Christians, we believe that what the Bible says is true, that it is true, that it is good, and that it is also beautiful. And that is why we are motivated to, to obey the scriptures, because of what Christ has done for us. And we want to share that with other people. We want them to also believe it and to live it as well. But when we show them the Christian worldview,
the, according to the scriptures, not according to what people say about what it says, but when we show them the Christian worldview from the scriptures, it gives them the opportunity to compare that to what they already believe about the world. And they get to choose what makes more sense, what gives me more hope, what's something that I actually want to live through. You know, I don't believe anybody like, wants to willingly live through life believing that there's nothing in the afterlife, that there's no meaning to life. That sounds like a pretty awful and, and miserable life to me. And maybe that's just my, my own worldview, not able to comprehend that other worldview. But certainly, we want others to have the worldview that the Bible presents to us, that they can have hope that they would have a better framework through which to live their lives, to see that all things through Christ are just simply better. But also, you can have a hope, a hope of eternal life of heaven. And that hope is a motivator for how you live your life and helps you do good and points you in the direction towards God to do good, what he says is good, right, and true. This concept of worldview is very important. Some have suggested that it is the missing link to evangelism. When we miss these things, we can miss a very critical part about how to talk to people and what do we talk to them about. And it's, all it takes is a simple conversation. What do you think about God? You know, does, does mankind have a purpose? Can, can, we, can we really know who God is? Do you believe in a right and a wrong? What do you think about what happens after death? It's a simple conversation. But these kinds of things are things we need to be talking to people about. These are all subjects that the Bible speaks to. And we need to tell them what the Bible says about these subjects. A few last observations about worldview, and then the lesson will be yours. The Bible acknowledges that there are many different worldviews that the world offers to us. If you would, I'm, I have up, most of these up here on the screen, but Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirit, spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The Bible acknowledges that there are many worldviews that are not the same as what the, uh, not according to Christ, to use the language Paul uses here the, the, to the Colossians. But he qualifies by describing these things as philosophy, empty deceit, and what are these things according to? They're according to human tradition. Sometimes people don't want to change because they like things just the way they are, and they're not willing to change that. And he says, don't be taken captive by that. Don't be deceived by these teachings about what is right simply because that's someone's tradition and they don't want to change. Because those things are according to the principles of the world and they are not according to Christ. The Bible acknowledges that there are worldviews out in the world that are not according to Christ. There's a lot of worldviews out there. Again, we live in a world full of ideas. Which ones do you think are right and true? I think the Bibles are right and true. But there are many people in the world who don't. And we need to, to, to con talk to them about why the Bible is right and perhaps show them that it is better than what they currently believe. The Bible also, call, or God calls us to have a biblical worldview. Romans 12, 1 through 2, I have up here. We come to this passage often because it is so applicable in so many things. But let's read it again. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Did you catch what he says in verse 2 there? Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to the way the world thinks and the way the world lives. In fact, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Live the way that God says you are to live. But verse 1 itself is a worldview of itself. By the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. That is a lifestyle. Is that a framework through which someone can, can look at the world and, it, and live through it and interact with it? Absolutely. God calls us to have the biblical worldview, knowing full well that we live in a world full of ideas and that there's many other ways you could choose to live your life. But he says, don't be conformed to this world. In fact, be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you might find out what is good and acceptable and perfect according to God rather than what the world says. God calls us to compare the biblical worldview to those of the world. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Paul wrote to the Ephesians that you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, speaking to the, the worldview of this world, 
following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You know, that's what we were like before we became Christians, when we were living according to a worldview that was not the Christian worldview, through that framework that the Bible gives us to live through. But let me ask you, I think, an, an implied question of this text. How was that working for you before you became a Christian? How does a worldview that you may have or that the world has, how does that work for them? Is that benefiting them any? According to the scripture here, you were once sons of disobedience. You were carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. You were following the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan, by the way. You're, being, you're following Satan? How's that working for you away from God? Certainly, the Bible calls us to compare the Christian worldview to that of the rest of the world. And constantly, as I study the subject, as I read the scriptures, and I see what the Bible tells me about God, about mankind, about knowledge, about reality, and eternal reality, I keep coming back to it. It makes the most sense. And I can't imagine something being better than that. In fact, you take away any of those things, certainly the world just seems like a darker place. There's something that's wrong when we don't have what the Bible says about this subject. But also, this, this is a huge point, speaking to the fact that we can know God. I don't have this one up on the screen, so turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. God has paved the way for us to know him. And by way of invitation this morning, if you're not a Christian, I want you to hear the words that Paul says here about knowing God. And after we read this passage, the invitation will be yours. But read what Paul says here about, for, about God, about knowing God here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Paul says, But, that, but as, it, as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit t searches everything, even the depths of God, for who knows what a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. You can know God. And if you want to know what God says is the meaning of life, if you want to know the spiritual truths that God has revealed to us that we may know how we ought to live, you need to read the scriptures. You need to obey the gospel, and you need to live a life that is following in the footsteps of Jesus. You need to live in relationship with Jesus. If you want to know what is the proper way to live your life, if you have questions about what those big five major basic questions, if you have concerns about those things, about where you're going to go, the Bible offers you hope where other worldviews don't. You can have a hope of heaven, of placing a reservation in heaven, dwelling in that new Jerusalem where God wants to be with you. We've made the point in our Revelation class that so oftentimes we think about heaven as, oh, I'm going to heaven to be with God, when Revelation speaks to us about, no, God wants to be with you. If you want to be with him, God wants to be with you. And he is creating a place where he can go and live with you for eternity. But not everybody just gets to go in there. God requires some things of you if you want to be one of those people whom he wants to live with for eternity. If you want to become one of those kind of people who dwells with God in heaven for eternity, you need to obey the gospel this time. And we invite you to do so. Come now as we stand and sing the invitation song. We will help you become a...